So, okay, hi everyone. Thank you for joining us for the um, first Wednesday of the month GoGN webinar. Uh, today, our presenter is uh, Glenda Cox, who is a senior lecturer in the Centre for Innovation, Learning, and, in Learning and Teaching. It's Silt, is that you pronounce it? Uh, at the University of Cape Town, uh, and Glenda's been was one of our very first uh, uh, GoGN alumni. Um, researching OER and open educational practice uh, in Cape Town. Um, and she's also a member of the Raw 4D team who we've worked closely with a lot for a number of years. Uh, but today she's going to be talking about a, a new project she's working on, which is about digital open textbooks for development. So I'm going to hand over to Glenda now and uh, I'll turn my mic off. Right, thank you very much, Martin. So yes, today I'm going to be introducing the Digital Open Textbooks for Development, or DOT4D project. Um, this project is a collaboration with myself and Michelle Wilmers. Um, and we also have a full-time researcher, Bianca, who I'm sure you'll meet at some point. So this project uh, has just started at the University of Cape Town. It started in July, and I'm going to tell you all a little bit about it. I'm going to talk uh, a little bit about our research approach and conceptual approach to this particular project and I give a few highlights around where we are at the moment and what we're hoping to achieve through this project. So just a little about my background very briefly. Um, I started doing research in open education around 2010. Um, when it became part of my job portfolio. And since then, I have been part of the GoGN network, as you all know, and completed my PhD in open education. I uh, was part of the Raw 4D project as a sub-project leader, um, based, a project based in South Africa. And now I'm leading up this new project on digital open textbooks. So I work in the Center for Innovation for Learning and Teaching, I also do staff development work, and I also teach on a curriculum and course design course. So those are just some of the, the things that I'm interested in and I work on. So this is kind of an, an image um, to, to show the three different components of this uh, particular project. And I'll elaborate a little bit more on them later in the presentation, but just to introduce the basics of what we're trying to achieve in this project. So we have three, three parts to it. Um, one is the research part. So we're going to be looking, doing a case, case studies, um, four different case studies at UCT um, to find out what's happening with existing open textbooks at UCT um, at the same time as doing those case studies um, and a process that has just started is a landscape survey at UCT. So we're looking at um, open textbooks that have already been developed, looking at how people have, have gone about creating these open textbooks, the technical side, the pedagogical side, um, and really getting a nice baseline idea of what's happening at the University of Cape Town specifically. So I need to maybe mention that, and I didn't really in the beginning. But this project is based at the University of Cape Town. So we will be extending it out in the advocacy um, section. But for now, we're looking at what's happening at UCT. So we have this large research component. Uh, and then we also have some money to give academics at UCT to develop open textbooks. So we have grants. Uh, and we have particular grant criteria that we're looking at, and that I'll explain as we go along. But that's a really nice um, implementation aspect of the project, where we're actually giving academics some money to develop these textbooks. Um, and then we also have um, an advocacy section where we are looking at open education policy across South Africa um, in all the different institutions, 26 of them. And here we're hoping to include stakeholders at other institutions who are also interested in open textbooks, but we would like to ultimately develop an open education policy brief uh, and also introduce this to government. So that's our advocacy um, 
part of, of this particular project. So this project um, sits in the South African higher education context, and it's been quite an exciting place to be the last few years. Um, and we feel, Michelle and I, and everyone involved in this project right from the very beginning, that this is a very good time to introduce open textbooks into South Africa, um, given the context. So universities in South Africa um, over the last few years, not, not this year, not 2018, but the three years prior to that, um, were disrupted by student protest. And these protests came in different forms. Uh, the universities were shut down. Um, some were shut down for longer than others. Sometimes there was quite violent protest. And the init initial fees must fall movement was directed at the cost of higher education in South Africa and really directed at government to um, try and address, address the issue of um, higher education being unaffordable for most people. So there was the fees must fall movement. Um, but in addition to that, there, were also, uh, there was also a drive to change curriculum in South Africa. And certainly this is a South African um, historical issue around colonialism and decolonizing the curriculum. But this is also a call from students that the curriculum should become more relevant. And so a whole set of questions has um, evolved out of these protests that have very usefully made us think very deeply about our curriculum and how we teach our curriculum. And questions have emerged around what knowledge is represented, whose knowledge, who's being represented, who's being excluded and included, who, who is taking the position of the author and are we declaring that position? Where are the gaps and silences and absences? Who is invisible in the curriculum and who is being marginalized by the curriculum? So these are all debates that are happening at the moment in higher education in South Africa. Um, and in our context in, at UCT, we have a curriculum change forums that are looking at curriculum change across the university. And so when we were writing up this proposal, um, which is funded by the IDRC, we came, we went at this particular project from a specific, with specific, specific objectives around addressing the issues that came out of the student protests. Um, so fees must fall certainly an economic dimension around the cost of textbooks, um, but then also this idea of roads must fall, where um, statues of co colonists were taken down, um, and there was one particular uh, statue at UCT that was taken down. But the, the history behind that injustice is, is around the cultural and, and political dimensions that need to be addressed in higher education. And um, when writing this proposal, we were suggesting that open education is a way of addressing, addressing these injustices. So we see that there's a great potential for open textbooks in South Africa, um, and specifically related to what I've just highlighted. And as an open education audience, uh, we know that um, OER has a lot of potential, and we know that it has potential in the Global South, and this has come through extensive research. And it has the potential to address these ideas of cultural inequality and misrepresentation, um, and it has the potential to um, include a localization of materials that's very important for us, um, and also certainly um, address the issue of access and cost. Um, as these resources are typically free to the user. So globally, um, when we talk about open textbooks, uh, the idea of cost has been highlighted as, as a, a segue, as a way of getting into making an argument for open textbooks. And um, certainly in South Africa, the cost issue is very important, but we want to take this a little bit further and really look at the idea of, of localization um, and also looking at the idea of collaborating 
um, a more collaborative approach to producing resources. And here I've talked about open educational practices, but as we know, those have to be in place for any kind of open education resource or open textbook uh, to be created. But the power of this is around these alternative epistemic views, um, which is what we want in our curriculum now in South Africa. Um, this idea of collaborating with colleagues, but also co-creating with students. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about what we're hoping might be a potential role for students. Um, and then other kind of obvious ideas around circulating and sharing OER um, and also opening up critique by others um, and quality assurance. So these are all the kind of the value propositions <clears throat> of open education. So that's where our digital open textbooks for development projects comes in. Um, and as I said, it's funded by the Canadian IDRC. Uh, it's, the start date was um, July this year, and it goes on till December 2020. So it's a 30 month project um, based at UCT. And so following on from what I've been saying around um, these dimensions of, of social of injustice. We want to introduce phrases, social justice dimensions as a way um, of analyze, of approaching how we look at textbooks, how we analyze our research, how we look at case studies, how we look at what's happening on the ground in open textbooks, um, and how we ultimately write up what we find. So we've got this sort of quite a a research type approach to what we're doing, which is what the IDRC wants. But I know as, as GOGNers, as PhD students or PhD alumni, as people interested in, in open education, um, we're, uh, we're hoping that this is interesting, um, this, uh, this conceptual model. And I'll talk a little bit more about um, social justice in a while. Um, then we're also interested in intersectionality, and I'm also going to talk about that as an approach to how we select case studies and select grant recipients. Um, and then the third piece of this puzzle, the third component that comes in to hopefully um, give us really strong tools for analyzing what we find is the social realism of Margaret Archer. Um, I used Margaret Archer in my PhD thesis, and she talks about the power of agency. And so in these studies, we're going to be doing detailed case studies of individuals who are writing textbooks um, and also of, of the grant recipients to really understand their agency and their role in producing open textbooks in, in this particular context. So those are the three um, three aspects that I'm going to kind of draw together in this next part of, of this presentation. So the work of, of Nancy Fraser um, was actually kind of, it was really Cheryl, Cheryl Hodgkinson Williams who started looking at, at Nancy Fraser's work. Um, towards the end of, in fact, just in the sort of post raw d period where we had about six months to write up some of those founding, findings, um, Cheryl started looking at social justice as a way of um, looking at a parity of participation and the potential of this kind of approach to look at how we can use OER to address these three dimensions. So, and, and these dimensions tie in with those student protests that I was talking about earlier. So there's the economic dimension. Um, so here, the injustice is around the maldistribution of resources and economic equality, um, and that idea of fees must fall. But then the cultural, and then the cultural dimension is this misrecognition of the attributes of people and practices according less respect and status inequality. Um, and we can see how that relates to this idea of uh, decolonizing the, the curriculum. Um, and then also the political uh, dimension. So the misrepresentation of the lacking of the right to frame the discourse. So this is an important part where we want to have the voice of students, have the voice of a wider range of participation in creating textbooks. So that is in a nutshell, very, very briefly, 
is the work of Nancy Fraser and this framework that we would like to apply to dot 4 d So this this is this is work by Hodgkinson Williams and Trotter. Um, I've got the reference at the end of this presentation. Uh, really highly recommended that you go and uh, read this work of Cheryl and and Henry's, um, who no doubt some of you have met. Um, and I'm just going to show you one one little aspect of this quite detailed framework that they've um, that they've worked on, where they've looked at some of the results from the research on OER for development project in the global south. So if we look at the economic dimension here, we can see in the first column the economic dimension and then the injustices around that. And then and applying this specifically to the global south and specifically to the idea of open education resources, not specifically textbooks, but more general open education resources. And we can see in our context, if we look at the mull distribution, we have things like intermittent power supply, which is currently happening right here now in South Africa, um, inadequate access to computing devices, um, expensive and or poor connectivity, um, and OER that's only available digitally. So people without access are not able, able to access it. So that's where the, there would be an injustice done through, if we were trying to use OER, a lot of people would not have access to it. Then Archer uh, Fraser talks about an affirmative response. So we have this injustice. How can we address that injustice in kind of quite a basic way? Um, how do we deal with that and redistribute? And here we can see kind of just a few basic steps that can be done that we often think about when we design OER and what we would certainly consider for our open textbooks is having a printed version, um, having um, OER easily and cheaply available to download, um, having different formats uh, depending on what access you have. Um, and in our context, um, having MOOCs available, certainly, and we do have MOOCs available, but have the resources all available as open education resources for anyone to access. So that's kind of the most basic and affirmative response. But then Fraser also talks about a transformative response, so really changing the way things are done. And this is kind of the ultimate um, response that we would like to see um, that really addresses inequality. And here we need to kind of look at big picture and and almost a kind of a what we ultimately really like to see what hap happening in South Africa or in the global south. So things like stable power, um, affordable devices, um, more connectivity in rural environments. And certainly the government um, and or institutional funding for OER creation. So this is something that happens through small projects like this one I'm talking about now and other projects that we've had, but the government and institutions haven't really backed us in the way that we would like. So this is where we would like to move towards um, this kind of, and also an acceptance of OERs or MOOCs as micro-credentials. So these are kind of the ultimate restructuring goals. And this is just the economic dimension that I'm highlighting here. If you read um, Hodgkinson, Williams and Trotter, uh, you will see how they've looked at OER um, across all the different dimensions um, and found ways of, of really doing an ameliorative response and a transformative response. So that was a little bit on, on Fraser and, and how we're starting to think about how we can look at it to look at Fraser, and I'll talk a little bit more about it later, but look at Fraser to to unpack what's happening with open textbooks um, in South Africa at the moment. And then we're also very interested in an intersectionality approach. When we started looking at digital open textbooks and um, having these discussions with the IDRC, the idea of gender equality was um, very important. Uh, this is a push from the IDRC at the moment, coming directly from Trudeau's government, where um, gender equality is, is, is a priority for their government and all their development projects. So we started off looking at gender equality um, and 
had gender consultants come in and do a little study for us around open education and gender equality and how we could approach open textbooks with a gender lens. Uh, and as we considered what the, the what we had, the reports that we had, the research that we did, we felt that really our approach should be something that's more intersectionality approached, um, where we're considering way more than just sexuality. We're also looking at race, which is very important in our context, um, class, language, culture, ethnicity, age, ability, sexuality, and education. So these are all aspects that we want to consider when we're looking at the current models of textbook provision, um, deciding on our grant holders and deciding um, how we guide those grant holders in creating their open textbooks. So um, we have Nancy Fraser and we have the intersectional approach. And so this is just a little example and, and we're, we are now six months into the project and we've still got a lot of work to do. So this is very much work in progress. Um, but what we're thinking of now is ways of, of creating questions that we can use as interview questions, but also questions that we can interrogate what we find. Um, so we're starting to put all these pieces together. Um, so here you can see um, intersectionality indicators. So, and specifically around, as an example, and I, I'm not going to go through all of them, but here, Nancy Fraser's cultural dimension. So in the cultural dimension, indicators would be things like gender, sexuality, I'm not going to go through the whole list, but we thought of quite an extensive list that would come into the cultural injustice dimension um, of phrases. And then we've started to look at examples of questions, and these certainly aren't final questions, but this is the kind of thinking that we're interested in um, and we'll be interested, interested to hear if anyone else is thinking along these lines. Um, but this is what we're thinking about creating things like, how does the curricula prevent perpetuation of gender stereotypes? How are women's and non-gender conforming people's knowledge sourced or cited or prescribed in open textbooks or in the curricula? What are the intersectional barriers to equitable participation of women and men? What percentage of prescribed readings in textbooks are authored by women? So a lot of kind of quite, we think, fundamental issues that can be explored within open textbooks at UCT um, and within the textbooks that will be created during the course of, of this project. So these are the kinds of things that quite nuanced things we're hoping um, to really kind of try and understand this relationship between intersectionality um, and social justice. So that's just one example. I'm not going to go through them all. Well, yeah, too long. Um, and then I talked earlier about Archer and about agency. So if we look at the conceptual model that we're forming, we are looking at big picture issues through Fraser around these big, these dimensions around um, economic and cultural and political. So we're looking at the context and the structures that are surrounding individuals in quite a deep way. Um, but what we found with Fraser is that she's not really interrogating agency. She's not going down to that more sort of micro level. And in our work, we realize we are going to be grappling with this idea of agency. And Margaret Archer provides tools um, and ways of, of um, allowing the researcher to interrogate the motivations and the concerns of agents. So this is another component. So hopefully we're going to have this complete picture of, of, a, of the culture, um, of the structure, of the political dimensions, and then also of the agency of the individual. And here we would be looking at questions of quite basic questions around what were your reasons for sharing and what are your personal motivations? Um, and, and really understanding the journey of these individuals who have made open textbooks and trying to understand how they've managed to do that. Often against all odds, um, the textbooks that exist at UCT were not supported in any way. They did not receive any kind of resources. These were textbooks created because the individual felt that, uh, felt quite passionately about 
sharing their teaching materials more broadly, um, that it was a, a almost a, a motivation and a calling for them to share these resources. And they did this in their own time, in their evenings, whenever they could. We want to understand that motivation behind um, why they actually did these, made these open textbooks and why they want to and produce open textbooks. So that is hopefully um, going to give us this, this conceptual model and I'm sure as we delve into it um, in a lot of detail over the next few months, uh, this will become a little bit more refined and more precise than the way I'm describing it to you right now. Um, but this is kind of what we're looking at, these, these three components fitting together as a way of analyzing what we find. So it's this is a kind of a diagram, but this might change at some point, but hopefully it kind of gives you the visual of the components that we're thinking about. So yes, so back back to these different components and, and, and where we are now. So we want to use that conceptual model to inform our research process. Uh, the case studies that we're going to be doing, as well as the landscape survey. We are also going to use that conceptual model to look at our grant holders and the open textbooks that they create. So the research and grant um, components um, are hopefully covered in quite a bit of detail, and hopefully we'll have a, a really nice, rich stories to tell around um, these these innovators and these open education open educators that we find, that we have. So our project general objective um, is to contribute to improving inclusion in South African higher education by access to appropriate and relevant learning resources. And hopefully through explaining the conceptual model to you, I've made quite clear how we're hoping to, to do that um, and how we're hoping to analyze how we achieve that inclusion um, as we go along through this project. And then to take a slightly different tack, which um, I'm hoping will be will be interesting as a an, another kind of approach to what we're doing. So um, leading a project like this uh, with with um, external funding, as many of you will know, who lead projects like this, who are part of projects where you need to report to your funder, you want to tell your funder a quite complete story around what's been happening in your project and, and the impact that you have. We were also looking for a way of setting out our, our the way we, we go about our work, but also we wanted to find a way of measuring our impact. Um, and this is always something that we want to report to funders. What is the impact? What change in behavior can we actually report on at the end of our project so that our funders are happy with us um, and we feel that we've achieved what we've set out to in the beginning of the project? And so this little diagram here um, is just a piece of something called outcomes mapping. And I'm not sure if anyone has heard about it, but um, it's quite an interesting approach uh, that was developed by the IDRC and they've used it in a whole bunch of different projects. But um, when Michelle and I were discussing our project in the beginning, we were looking at looking at the IDRC for guide, looking towards them for guidance um, so that they could help us to kind of say, well, how can we measure impact and how can we is there a tool for doing this? And so they talked about outcomes mapping. And it's it's something that's, I think, quite interesting. There's a lot of information um, on the internet on it and guidebooks and, um, yeah, the videos and a lot of information about how to go about this, this particular process. Um, and and really, um, it's, about, it's about monitoring change in behavior. Um, of the people involved in the project. So, and those people are the stakeholders, but what the outcomes mapping call um, stakeholders or beneficiaries, they call them boundary partners. Um, and Michelle and I quite like this concept as a way of mapping out who's involved in our project, who the stakeholders are, and who the ultimate beneficiaries are. So we're going to use components of outcome mapping, outcomes mapping, 
um, it uses a very intentional design, a kind of a step by step process. Some of it is useful for us, perhaps not all of it, um, but we feel that it's going to be a nice way of really illustrating to the IDRC what we've achieved um, through this project. Um, and a nice way of identifying our boundary partners, um, the people that we're going to be working with. Um, and what it does is it allows us to monitor change in behavior in these boundary partners. I think that's all I'm going to talk about with, with outcomes mapping. I'll show you another slide in a moment. Um, it also has very nice little concepts around strategy maps that are particularly useful. And it also has an idea of journals. Um, Sorry, I think you lost me for a moment there. The stakeholders can actually set out um, what they would like to see in the project, what kind of um, outcomes they would like to have, and they can actually journal or write about this process um, and reflect at the process, the pro about the process at the end of the process. And we quite like that also as a, a useful tool. So who are our boundary partners and who will we be working with? Um, we've started to frame this. Um, this might not, just most probably not a complete list, but this is who we're looking at in the DOT4D project. So immediately our boundary partners are UCT academics. Um, and in this case, case studies, the case studies, are we going to do four case studies um, and also the grant recipients. So they, those would be boundary partners. Then UCT institutional managers certainly will be involved um, from the library, um, the, the Deputy Vice Chancellor of Teaching and Learning is quite interested in this project and has been supporting us in this project. Um, and the UCT students, very important. Um, we feel that they're key boundary partners. Um, I'll talk about that in, a little in a moment. Um, and then we have this much bigger um, stakeholder group where we're kind of then extending out. So, if we imagine our research component and our grant component being the key aspects where the boundary partners are going to be captured, the stakeholders will come in more in that kind of advocacy component where we're kind of trying to extend the reach of what we find. Um, so this is across higher education in other institutions. Um, and we've really started to try and reach out to some higher education institutions that we know are interested in open education. We have some conversations started with government. Um, we also have conversations started with UNESCO um, we, and the Commonwealth of Learning. Uh, we want to look at higher education students across South Africa, so more broader um, student groups. Um, open textbook publishers are certainly going to be stakeholders in this conversation. And then our beneficiaries are certainly the students, but also the academics. Um, they will be collaborating and hopefully benefiting from this, this, um, this project. Um, and then more broadly, um, UCT and all South African higher education institutions will hopefully benefit from the work that we're doing around open textbooks. And hopefully we'll be able to get our message out there um, and, and do a, a, really, a really good job at doing this kind of advocacy role that we're setting out to do. So where we are now, um, we are currently busy with the landscape survey. Um, so looking at academics who have already um, produced open textbooks or parts of open textbooks in some cases um, to understand various aspects of what they've been doing. Um, then we're going to be looking at uh, selecting case studies um, and all the time these processes are going to be informed by the intersectional um, um, lens and the social justice lens. And then we've just had our call for grants, very excitingly, on Monday went out um, via the DVC's desk. So we're hoping a lot of people have read it and we've really had really nice, interesting response from quite a few people. So we're extremely pleased with ourselves at the moment. Um, and what we're going to be working on um, now is um, select selection criteria for those grants. So going back to those priorities that we have around curriculum change being something very important that we want to see when we select grants. Um, 
student voice and student inclusion in the process is very important to us. Um, the decolonizing and transforming of the curriculum. Sustainability is also an issue. So although this is a, a pocket of money that we'll be giving to people, um, it's, it's finite, it's for a set period of time. How will they continue to develop their textbooks if they don't finish them in time? Uh, all of these different pieces will be used as, as grant criteria for, for selecting the grants because we have a limited pocket of money and it seems quite a lot of interest. So we need to do this in a in a, a very thorough manner. So that's where we are at the moment. It's quite still quite early days, I would say. Um, so hopefully I'll be able to present at a later stage with um, more interesting details about our case studies and the stories that we're hoping to tell about um, these individuals. So we've talked about fees must fall and we've talked about roads must fall um, and we're hoping to kind of start thinking about um, some new calls, some new hashtags um, that we want to promote in South Africa around that open must rise, that South voices must rise, and that open textbooks must rise. So we're just playing around with those and we we just want to kind of get the conversation going in, in a kind of, in an opening up and a rising up kind of way as opposed to a falling way. Um, and then this is um, some images from, um, the OpenStax Instagram site, um, yeah, and they are getting students to put up these um, these particular kind of uh, what is it a board with uh, a whiteboard um, with their opinions around open textbooks, and we're very interested to try and mobilise students. We feel that they haven't been mobilised enough in the past. Uh, our experience of open education and even something quite simple like using the learning management system at UCT. Uh, staff were quite reluctant to move over, but when they were pushed by students, um, they ended up um, using the LMS to, to a greater extent. We saw the same thing with lecture recording, where students would demand that lectures were recorded. So the student force is powerful. So if we can get students to see the benefits of free textbooks, we feel that they might be a really powerful voice moving forward. Um, and so we're hoping in our orientation week, um, which will be in February, um, to do kind of a promotion with open textbooks. Um, and we're speaking to some of the students who have been involved in the past around Fees Must Fall, but who are interested in open um, to try and change the conversation a little bit and, and, and hopefully open up a new conversation around open textbooks. So we'll certainly be trying to, to get to student voices, and that's something we're very interested in hearing from others around how um, they have mobilized student voices, and this is certainly an interesting example from, from OpenStax and Rice University. So yes, just in conclusion, um, so our approach goes beyond numbers. Um, we don't necessarily just want um, a certain amount of males and a certain amount of females. We don't want to only show, we do want to show a cost saving for sure, but we also want to address all aspects of transformation. We also want to look at the cultural and political transformation of curriculum through the creation of open textbooks. Um, and our approach holds at its core the agency of the textbook authors um, and enables and or empowers them to realize their projects and concerns. So we're working with people to create change um, within our institution and, and hopefully that's going to, these stories are going to impact on higher education in South Africa. So that's pretty much me, I think. Yeah, so there's more further reading. We have a, a website which has a little information on this. We've just also just launched the website, dot for d um, we have a few articles there and um, I think one or two presentations and we're going to be keeping up on news. Um, so if anyone is interested in that, um, if anyone has not had a look at the Raw for D edited volume, it is available at that link um, with um, chapters from all around the Global South um, of great interest. We've also shared all the data. Um, and as we go along with our dot for d we will also be um, walking our talk as much as possible and making um, our work open as we go along. Um, and that's our Twitter handle. 
And then the last two slides are um, the references for this particular presentation that I don't think I need to go to now. Um, but everything I've talked about is referenced there for further reading. So that's that's it. That's all for me. Um, I'm happy to also hand over to Michelle if she would like to add anything that I've, I'm so sure I've missed some things. Um, if Michelle would like to add, she's welcome to. She doesn't have to. Um, and if there are any questions, that would be great. Thanks. Thanks, Glenda. Uh, Michelle, do you want to come in with anything? No, nothing else said. Okay. <coughs> so first of all, I would say that's uh, hugely impressive. I, I really like the kind of conceptual framework that you've you've approached the problem with. You know, I've worked a lot with um, uh, open textbooks, and often they kind of put them out there first of all, and then think about what it is you want to evaluate. You know, and so I think to kind of do all this conceptual work up front is is really significant, actually. Um, as you know, we, we run a UK Open Textbooks project over here, and we're trying to find ways of getting that taken up at a more kind of government level, pretty much the way you've kind of outlined there. Um, we've got quite a lot of, we've got a few universities that run uh, open textbook presses for, for kind of academic publications, monographs, but less so for kind of um, the, the big undergrad um, open textbooks like the OpenStax do. So I just wanted to check, are you looking at both of those types of textbooks, you know, the kind of academic monograph and the, the course textbook, if you like? Yes, yeah, so our landscape survey, we want to cover everything that's currently happening and hopefully learn from that. So we, we also have um, monograph uh, publishing um, through the library. Very, very limited. Um, we haven't looked at them in detail. But we also have that that available, so that's kind of happened in one in the library. Uh, so we've got a lot to sort of unpack and uncover. We have um, a case already of an open stack uh, open stack book being used in physics. So we also have that, and we're very interested to hear how they've used that textbook, um, if they adapted it in any particular ways, what have students thought of the textbook. So we have what we think is a very interesting range from um, this kind of basic undergraduate figure physics um, to to kind of you know, more specific kinds of textbooks um, and different, some that are interactive and some that are simple PDFs that have been put online. Um, so I think we're going to draw quite a nice comprehensive picture um, of what's happening. And yes, it's a snapshot at UCT, but I think it's going to cover a whole lot of it's going to overlap with a lot of the work that you do and and the great work that BC Campus is also doing. I think there's going to be interesting conversations around where the models overlap and how people have designed these textbooks. Um, yeah, so yeah, we, we're going to be as comprehensive as we can be with what we what we have to work with here. Okay, thanks. Um, I, I don't know if Patricia or Sinead wants to have. Come, I, I don't. Want, I don't want to take over the questions. So if Patricia or Sinead have got any questions to ask, just put them in the chat box. Um, you, you mentioned, I think, I think the South Africa context is, is really interesting and um, I think perhaps more than, more than most places you can really see the value of open textbooks there, particularly around um, having people engage with the curriculum. I, I just wondered, perhaps it's too early, perhaps it, have you got any sense for all those motivations for open textbook adoption? which might be the kind of the strongest driver you think if you want to get people to adopt it which would be the the biggest hook for academics i, I wonder if you've got a sense of that yet or is it too early um i think we need to still discover that uh, i i think i think people up until if we look at it historically i think it has been around cost so i think people have realized that there's a need for a textbook um so, for example, the work of Johan Fagan, um, he was an Open Education Consortium um, award winner for his textbook. Um, and, and he's in um, health sciences and his particular textbook, he had written a textbook and the, he wanted to make it openly available. The publishers disagreed and said, well, it was still under copyright and they refused. So he rewrote and wrote a textbook 
with collaborate, collaborators. And he, he, the need was it was too expensive for people, for other African academics and other African students to access this book. So he needed to create something that was freely available. So this is a motivation around cost, certainly, but also this kind of personal concern for, for, for knowledge across the global south. Um, so that's that's kind of been a driver. We're hoping now this idea of curriculum transfer, transformation is a very powerful driver. Um, there's, there's quite considerable pressure. Um, we, we feel it, maybe we feel it specifically in, in because we're so involved in higher education development. But uh, and maybe not all lecturers feel it, but um, a lot of the lecturers who want to do this are doing it from the angle that they can include more voices, that they can make their textbooks more relevant to South African students um, than they were before. Um, so we're hoping that that's going to be a strong argument going forward. Thanks, Mark. Okay, thanks, Brenda. I think I'm going to pinch a lot of your stuff for uh, any, <laughs> any um, bids we've got going forward. I, I'm finding it quite, having got the initial funding from Hewlett to investigate the potential, I think I've been surprised at how much interest there is in the UK in open textbooks. Um, and, and everyone says it's a really good idea, but it's that getting it <laughs> to the next step, I think, is the real issue. Um, you know. It's like one of the things that everyone says, that's a great idea, but we haven't got any money. Um, so I think, that, I, I wondered if you had any thoughts about how to make that next step to kind of get up to, but perhaps that's what will come out of your project, I think, is that kind of foundational research and case studies. Um, yeah. yeah. If you, had, I mean, if you, if you had, any, had any thoughts, that would be great. Um, well, certainly um, one of the components I know that Michelle's very passionate about is 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 the is the copyright policy and actually having really understanding what's happening with copyright. Um, and and that is that is often a considerable barrier because people don't really understand the copyright and don't and often don't have the copyright. Um, the institution holds the copyright. So that's been a considerable barrier. So I, I can hand over to if, if Michelle wants to add anything here. But we do feel I must say I'm I'm I don't feel that uh, policy is the answer to all our um, and it's often ignored, but we do feel quite strongly about forming some sort of policy brief that we can take to government um, and institutions that can kind of guide institutional managers and government around encouraging open textbooks. I don't know if that sounds wishy-washy, but that's all I can give you at the moment. I don't know if Michelle like to add? I don't want to put you on the spot, Michelle. Yeah, I, I, I will. I will add. I would actually add something here. So, I, I think the point we were making earlier around. Can you hear me? Okay, because I'm I sounding terrible from my side. I can hear you clearly. Okay, I'm going to carry on. The point we were making about what we are looking at. And Martin, you were asking about open monographs. This is a really tricky feature of the research for us because we're used to working in the open generally. We're interested in open data, open research, open educational resources, open practice. But we're forced to focus quite specifically here on the textbook scenario for exactly the point of this advocacy. Because our institutional are also awash in a sea of imperatives around what they're expected to get behind and fund right now. You know, there has been the one wave after the other of open access, of open data, and, and now we're coming with an open textbook imperative. And so a, a point of our research is actually to try and narrow down and focus on definitional concept of what an open textbook is in our context. Taking into consideration all the points that Glenda has made about transformation and intersectionality, there's also the question of what's a, what is a desirable open textbook? So we have these tensions. So we're really interested in 
looking at open textbook that use innovative platforms like OpenStax and Pretext. At the same time, we're interested in balancing dimensions around disability access and can you print and download and redistribute the thing. So I, I think we're in a, an interesting, on interesting territory in terms of trying to arrive at a concept definition that works for us in our context that we can actually use in a policy making conversation because it's just too much to at both institutional and government level talk about open. Um, a, they're very different people who decide on budgets, whether those are research or teaching budgets. In our government system, they're entirely different ministries with different, some different amounts of disposable income to direct at different kinds of ideas or concepts, depending on how you package it for them. So in this context, I suppose I'm saying a number of things. One, we're trying to focus explicitly on the teaching and learning context for once, as opposed to research, which in our, con in our institutional context, there's a real tension around. Um, teaching is often the, the poorer cousin. Um, and then trying to arrive at some language and some shared definition and as part of that, working and, and, and contributing towards the growth of a community of practice that is having a conversation specifically about textbooks, textbook publishing industry, and as Glenda mentioned, a set of copyright factors that exert around this. We know that it's a continuum and a blur and particularly at postgraduate level, it's just to hop and escape and then is it a monograph or is it a textbook? But we're quite interested in the focused teaching and learning context here and the equity. Again, the, the boundary partners and the stakeholders in the teaching context can be quite different to those that might exert in research context. Okay, yeah, thanks. I think that, that I, I'd certainly... I have sympathy with that being awash with different imperatives yeah, and you feel like you've come along with yet another one. I think that, that's a very good point. I just want to, um, so both Sinead and Patricia are asking uh, about whether do you plan to create physical textbooks or online resources? I think you, I'm not sure if you mentioned that or not, but I'll let you answer that, Glenda. Okay. So we're looking, we're looking at digital open textbooks. So we definitely are looking at, at more kind of online resources. But we also realize that what, we, what we'd ultimately like is, is a flexible model where if somebody wanted the physical copy of the textbook that they could download it and, and cheaply. So a black and white kind of version of it. So we're looking at, at different kinds of resources. The, the open textbooks we create, we would like to have textbooks that um, are accessible to people with uh, who are maybe blind or, or visually impaired. Um, we would like different formats. We want uh, quizzes embedded. We would like interactivity embedded. So there, there are so many you know, wonderful technical platforms that have these kinds of bells and whistles. So we want to explore the whole range. Um, so, there, but certainly we also realize that in our context, not everybody has access to that. So we need to provide multiple formats. So this is, that is kind of what we're going to be looking at, sort of the whole range. So I hope that answers, Sinead, your question and, and, and maybe also Patricia. And Sinead, I think you mentioned er earlier that you thought the outcomes mapping um, is interesting and yeah I think it's quite an interesting design and we, we will certainly as we go along we'll we're going to use it quite critically and see whether it's actually useful for us along the way and um, yeah hopefully share some more on that and if you're interested in talking more um, you can always contact us about that. Is that okay? Okay thanks Glenda and thanks Michelle uh, so that brings us up to the hour so thank you very much it's really impressive and I'm, I'm Really pleased I found out more about it. <laughs> so we'll put that up on the, uh, the blog to come soon.
Great. Thank you, Martin. So thank you very much. And uh, Hi, Natalie. Yeah. speak to you soon. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, for coming in. Thank you. Thanks.